You can have it all. You can have the dream car, the dream house, maybe even the dream family. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you truly have nothing. The same is true with your kids. If you give your kids the dream life, they're on their favorite sports team, you give them the dream Christmas gift, the dream spring break. But if you don't pass on a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are giving them nothing. Come on, how we doing? You glad you made it to church today? Excellent. You may be seated. I read recently that when the owner of Red Bull passed away, he left his son $34 billion in inheritance. And just last year, on a down year, the dividend alone on that stock paid him $615 million. Lander, I think with the help of Dave Ramsey, we could live off of that. I think we could. I think I'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, that's generational wealth. That's the kind of money that generations of their family will be taken care of because of that inheritance. And as we've become parents, we've started to kind of think about that. You know, we, I think every parent wants their kid to have it a little better than they did, um, to have opportunities that, that I never had. And, and so we, we want to pass on generational wealth. Maybe some people in this room, you've been a benefactor of generational wealth. Maybe a down payment on a home or at the end of a parent's life, they pass on an inheritance that changes the game financially. That's amazing. That's what generational wealth is all about. Well, today, we want to talk to you about another type of generational wealth, one that has nothing to do with money, but everything to do with what you pass on. We're here today, and we can stand on this stage, not because of anything we've done, but because we've simply received this generational wealth. I'm talking about a wealth of faith, a spiritual wealth that, we, that was passed on to us. And when it comes to our faith, it's so important that we take the proper steps to pass it on. That's right. And in Matthew 16, verse 26, it says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? You can have it all. You can have the dream car, the dream house, maybe even the dream family. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you truly have nothing. The same is true with your kids. If you give your kids the dream life, they're on their favorite sports team, you give them the dream Christmas gift, the dream spring break. But if you don't pass on a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are giving them nothing. That's right, that's right. And maybe you're here today and you're in our season of life. You've got young kids. What an opportunity we have to pass something of true value onto them. Maybe you you don't have kids and maybe you wanna have kids. Man, the person that you become now, the person, the habits that you create now will dictate the kind of parent that you are. A switch doesn't just flip whenever you become a parent. We've gotta set those things in place now. And maybe you don't have kids or you maybe won't have kids. Well, maybe the next generation in your life is the next generation of Christ followers at your workplace or in your neighborhood or family members. And so there's always someone that we can pass our faith onto. And the key to passing on generational wealth is modeling generational wealth. Mm. I heard a story recently uh, about a man who shadowed a child psychologist. And this psychologist dealt primarily with traumatic situations. And so they're sitting down with a five-year-old kid and doing an evaluation. And kids primarily learn through playing. And so this child's playing with them and he's showing them how to roll a joint. And what's even more problematic are the things he was saying about women. Just at such a young age, five years old, he's talking so, you know, harshly and horribly about women. And they finished the session, 
And they're walking through the hallway and this man asked the psychologist, he says, hey, I've got a two-year-old son. So what do I need to tell him to make sure that he knows how to treat women properly? And the psychologist just laughed at him. He said, you can tell him whatever you want, but he's not gonna listen to you. He's just gonna watch you. Mm. And so if you want him to treat women right, treat your wife right. Mm. Treat his sisters right. And the same is true in our faith. Our faith is not so much taught. Yes, that's important, but it's, it's caught. Our kids can feel and pick up on the way we love the Lord, on the way that we walk out our faith. And so the first step to passing on this true generational wealth is to simply pass on a relationship with Jesus. And the operative word there is relationship. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He said, this is the most important commandment, the greatest commandment, your heart, your soul, in your mind. He didn't say this is the greatest opinion. <laughs> he didn't say this is the greatest option or the greatest key to a successful life. No, it's a commandment in God's word. And he says to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, everything we have. This whole thing, it should just ooze out of us, our love for the Lord. Mm. I'll give you an example. I'm from Tennessee, and I am a massive Tennessee Volunteers fan. I mean, it's just a part of my DNA at this point. And so when we had our kids, I was determined that they, too, were going to be volunteers. I, vo I voluntold them to be volunteers. You know what I'm saying? And the way I did it, it wasn't like I sat them down and said, all right, listen here, son, this is what we do as a family, okay? We're Tennessee. No, I didn't say that. They just saw me watching college game day on Saturday mornings. They saw me cheering when we scored a touchdown, singing Rocky Top every single time, and guess what? Here in about seven or eight weeks, I mean, who's counting, when college football starts, our house will be wearing all orange, we'll be shouting Rocky Top, we'll be cheering at every touchdown, we'll be crying after every loss. I mean, it's a way of life in the Hughes household. And the reality is that that was caught from my passion. Yeah. But I would be making a massive mistake if I passed on my Tennessee fandom and never passed on my love for the Lord. That's right. And there are so many examples on how you can pass on that relationship with Jesus Christ to your kids. The first one being is having a daily quiet time. I remember um, growing up through elementary school, middle school, I'd always wake up and I would come down the stairs and I would always see both my parents' Bibles wide open with a cup of coffee. And that wasn't just a small thing, that was a big thing because for me, I knew every single morning my parents started their day with Jesus. And so parents, start your day with Jesus. Have your kids see that you're spending time in God's word daily. It is so important to do that. Also pray with your kids. If you're believing God for a miracle to happen in your family, maybe a loved one's sick and you're believing for healing, bring your children into that prayer. Be praying for people that maybe are far away from Christ that need to come to know him. Be praying with your kids. Also, share God's word with your kids. We started something um, recently of before we put our kids to bed, we do God's words are the last words. So the last words our kids hear are God's words. And there's so much power in that. Um, I am the person, the child, who is always the illustration here on this stage. Unfortunately, I have a twin sister, and she's perfect, um, but I, you know, just stretched it out a little bit, and so um, it's fun because I'm up here, and I can now share all the stories about my parents, and they can't do anything about it, so it's great. You they, got the mic. They right? could kick me off, but you know what? I'm not going to get off, so it's fine. <laughs> um, but growing up, my dad, he would always share 
like crazy stories. And whatever stories he would share at church, just times that about a billion. And those were the crazy stories that we got at home. And so he loved making up these elaborate bedtime stories. And that sounds great, right? But if you're a six-year-old little girl scared of little things, maybe that's not that great. And so uh, my dad, he would tell stories about windows. Like he would always theme them too, like windows. I mean, that's just, there's windows everywhere, but why did a window scare me? It was the sound effects he put around it. Um, and then he would tell stories about different coyotes. We lived on some acreage and we would always hear the coyotes howling at night. So he thought in his mind, it would be a good idea to do a bedtime story about coyotes. And so in my mind, I have like coyotes and windows. I'm like, oh my gosh, is a coyote going to come through my window? Like this is awful. And so I would go to bed and sure enough, I would have a bad dream about one of those stories, am I right? And so I would go up to my parents' room and I would just say, mom, dad, I'm so scared of the coyote in the window. My dad's like, oh gosh. And so he would walk me down the stairs and he would put me in my bed and he would say, Landra, I know you're scared, but when you're scared, we pray. And we pray to the Lord and we ask him to help us. We ask him to give us peace. We ask him to give us comfort and to take all those bad dreams away. And so at a young age, I was taught that when I was scared, when I was worried, when I was anxious, what is the first thing that I do? I give it to the Lord. I lay it at his feet and I pray. And that is such a simple way to be able to pass on this generational wealth. That's right. So if you're taking notes, write that down. Traumatize your kids so that they pray more. All right. Got it. Sick. I love the story Jesus tells about two men who built houses. One built their house on the rock, and he calls him wise. Another built his house on the sand, and Jesus called him a fool. The wise man, Jesus said, is the one who hears Jesus's words and puts them into action. The fool is the one who hears Jesus's words and doesn't. And so the things we're talking about here today, a relationship with Jesus is the rock of our foundation. It's the rock of our lives. It's the rock of our home. We should all be building our house on the rock because when the wind and the waves come, guess what? Jesus will still be standing. We can still cling to Jesus. But the reality is in this day and age, there are so many sandy things that are clamoring for our time. I'm talking about things like sports, things like extracurricular activities, you know, theater, band, even academics itself. These are good things, but I'm just telling you, They're sand. They're here one moment and then they're gone the next. I will never play another football game as long as I live. It's gone. It's over. But guess what? I still have my faith in Jesus every single day of my life. Mm. And so we have to cling to the rock and cling to Jesus and Watch what happens in our family's lives. And I'm going to brag on you for a second. This guy played college football, y'all. That's legit. And don't don't be too sudden to clap. Um, Honestly, no one really clapped. I know. So I'm a it's concerned. okay. Let's try this again. He played college football, y'all. Stop it. You're it's too a big kind. deal. So anyway, but the reason I say that is he played college sports, he had camps, whatever it might be, and his parents still made church a priority. Every Wednesday night and every Sunday morning, he was there. So students, if you want to play a college sport, I highly recommend getting involved in church and look at what God can do. Am I right? (laughs) Amen. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Number two, if you're going to pass on generational wealth, you've got to pass on a love for God's house. That's right? right. There should be a gladness when coming to church. And parents, we set the tone. If we have a good attitude about coming to church, I'm telling you, your kids are going to have a good attitude about coming to church. And here at Fellowship Church, we make it easy. I know it's such an amazing church. 
church, I'm biased, but we have Krispy Kreme donuts in the morning. And I don't know about you, but I've never not had a smile on my face when I've seen a Krispy Kreme donut. So it's easy to smile and bring your kids to church here at Fellowship Church. But no, there should be a sense of gladness when coming to church right. um, because it is such an exciting thing. I look back on my life and there were so many times that I necessarily didn't want to go to church. I know it's shocking, but in a pastor's family, as a pastor's kid, I didn't always want to attend church. There were times on Wednesday nights or maybe Sunday mornings where I was like, oh, I just don't want to go to church. I don't understand why we have to go all the time. And my mom was like, I don't even care what you're saying. You're getting your bottom church. And so we didn't have an option. And then throughout the years, I then I talk about this a lot in my story, but I developed a severe eating disorder. And so through my eating disorder, I dealt with depression and anxiety. And it was such a dark time in my life. And through those years, my parents made me go to church even when I didn't want to. Then fast forward through finding my healing and recovery, marrying the love of my life, then having three little kids, involved in church. Church is such an amazing thing for me. Then three and a half years ago, the worst thing happened to our family. I lost my older sister, Lee Beth. And through that tragedy and through that heartbreak, the first place I knew I needed to be was the church. Right. So whenever, just like Brad said, the storms come and life trials come, when you have the church, there is nothing like it. So make church a priority and be glad when coming to church. That's right. The church shouldn't be an inconvenience for any of us. It should be an inspiration. Mm. We live in a world today that is just totally opposed to Christian values and Christian morality and God's way of life. And when we step foot on this campus, it should be something that fills our souls up. I don't know about you, but when I walk in here and I see hundreds of people who are choosing to put the Lord first in their life and choosing to say, hey, I'm going to give the first day of my week to God. And it reminds me that I'm not alone, mm. that, that I'm not in this thing alone. Even though I see all these things out here in the world saying this and saying that about what we believe, guess what? We're here and we're standing together right. as a church. The church is the hope of the world. And we as parents have to see that and instill that in our children. And we do it by just setting those priorities at an early age, an early time in their life to know that, hey, Jesus is number one. Our marriage is number two. The church is right there at number three. And then our kids, yeah, you're in the top four. Come on, you made it. But then you can fill in all of the awesome extracurricular activities you want to do. But we always keep those top four in place, which leads us to number three. If we're going to hand our kids generational wealth, we've got to pass on God's purpose for their life. Mm. Maybe you've heard of the verse, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. You see that all over t-shirts, coffee mugs, Instagram bios, you name it. It's an amazing verse. It encourages us to this day. Well, the prophet who pinned that verse, Jeremiah, early on in his ministry was going through a time of extreme doubt. He didn't know if he could do what God had called him to do. And check out what God says to him in the beginning of that book. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you, meaning I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. See, Jeremiah would go on to do amazing things for God. He would encourage the people of Israel in a dark and desolate time. And he continues to encourage each and every one of us here today. But before you get Jeremiah 29, 11, you've got to have Jeremiah 1, 5 where God speaks into his life and tells him who he is. It's so important while 
Jeremiah's heavenly father did that for him. We need some earthly fathers and some earthly mothers who can do that for our children. Because here's the thing, only you know the gifts God has given your kid. You see them every day. You're around them at the house or around them at practice and you pick them up from school. You know those traits that only God has placed in their lives and it's up to us to call those things out. Mm. I'll say it like this. Let your voice repeat God's voice so that one day God's voice can replace your voice. That's all we could ever want as parents. That's right, and there are so many things that we can do to call that out in our children. I know it's easy for us, we're a sports family. Um, our kids aren't at age yet, but when they are, um, we Oh, Jackson will... can hit a baseball. Okay. I've got a four-year-old who can fully hit a, you know, a fastball, so. Brad's like coaching him like he's 14. I'm like, honey, he just turned four, it's okay. But anyway, we're gonna be a sports family, and I think it's easy when they're doing sports, maybe it's theater, dance, whatever it might be, band. It's easy to call those things out in your kids. Oh, you did so good in that um, band recital. Or man, that touchdown you did was awesome. Or that hit that you hit, man, that was amazing. And that's, those are all great things. But you know what? It's important to start calling out things that God's word talks about. Calling out the fruit of the spirit in of our kids. Calling out different leadership qualities our kids might have. Or maybe your child is a light in their school and just equipping them and calling that out in them. Is, you, you know what, child? You are a light in this dark school. And we know that Jesus Jesus is shining through you. There's power when we call that out in our kids. And I know growing up that um, my parents definitely called out a lot of things in me. Um, I don't know if any of you guys were here for Christmas, but I kind of was the star of the show, as you would say. But um, we, my dad preached on this past Christmas. He called it a Christmas from hell. How many of you guys were here at Christmas? It's okay, you can be honest. Okay, great, you're here at Christmas. So if you weren't here at Christmas, just go to YouTube, it's great, it's really funny. But anyway, the story is, it was Christmas Eve, my dad had just preached eight services. I was 12, he came home, and my older sister at the time accused me of stealing $100 from her. And y'all, $100 is a lot of money. And so I, my parents asked me about it, I said, no, I didn't steal the $100. Well, on Christmas Eve, I came clean about it, and my dad just talks about how he just preached his guts out. He literally said that, preached his guts out. And then he comes home and his family's like falling apart, right? See, the pastor's family, we're normal, I promise you. Um, you might not believe it after this message, but we are normal. Um, but anyway, so I steal the $100 from him and y'all will not believe this. Literally this past week, I have a six-year-old daughter, Sterling. I got $100 for my birthday and I was so excited because I was like, $100 cash? Like, this is awesome. I can go buy anything I want. And um, so excited about it. And Sterling loves to go through my purse, loves it. Like if I get a new lip gloss, it's gone like the next day because Sterling will take it out of my purse and go like hide it somewhere. So I'm like going about my day and I go, I'm like, you know what? I should probably like go get my hundred dollars and go shopping. Well, I go look at my wallet. My hundred dollars is not there. And I'm like, where in the world is my hundred dollars? So I march up to Sterling's room and I open the door and I say, we call her Sissy. I'm like, Sissy, do you know where mommy's hundred dollars is? And she goes, no, I didn't take it. <laughs> and I'm like, sweet child, you have no idea who you're dealing with. I was like, I am the expert at stealing $100 as a kid, okay? So you need to get your act together. No, but I'm like getting her piggy bank out, shaking it. I'm like, I know it's in here. <laughs> and so finally she starts crying. She's like, I took your $100, I'm sorry. And I'm like, well, do you know where it is? She's like, no, I don't. I'm like, oh, great. So now I'm like, Brad, my wrongdoings are now coming to bite me. Yeah, we're in a generational deficit now. I mean, I'm like, seriously, talk about generational wealth. Y'all just be really praying for us. But anyway, so I remember the Christmas from hell story just like it was yesterday. And whenever I stole that $100 bill, I remember I was so upset about it. And it was Christmas Eve and my parents had this leather chair in the corner of their bedroom and my dad was sitting in it and I crawled in his lap and just tears flowing down my face. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I stole the money, I'm sorry. He said, Landra, I forgive you. God forgives you, but I wanna tell you, you have a calling on your life. 
God is gonna do great things in and through you. And I said, even though I stole the $100, he said, even though you stole the $100. Then fast forward after dealing with everything with my eating disorder, I might've had a bad night and I ran to their room upset. I crawled up in my dad's lap when he was in that leather chair. I said, dad, I just don't know if I'll ever be able to overcome this addiction. I don't know if I'll ever not be depressed or anxious. And he looked at me and he said, Landra, yes, you will. You will overcome this. God is going to do great things in and through you. He has a calling on your life. And that's when my mom looked at me. She said, Landra, your misery right now will become your ministry. Parents, your words are so powerful. Call things out in your kids, because that is how we can find that true generational wealth. You know, I have the privilege of actually being fifth generation in the ministry, going all the way back to my great-great-grandfather who delivered the gospel on horseback in the mid-1800s. That's not a joke. And I tell you that, not, it's not anything about me. It's not to brag or anything like that. It's to illustrate that the decisions we make to be faithful hmm. and to put God first in our lives and to instill these values in our kids can impact five generations down the line. Hmm. And I'll never forget my grandfather who I looked up to. He was in ministry for over 58 years. He started when he was 16 years old and did it all of his life. And at the end of his life, I remember sitting in a dingy little hospice room with all of our family and friends. And this man that stood 10 feet tall in my eyes was clearly having his final days. And he went around this room and he just began to say his goodbyes to our family and our friends. And he would say to some, he would encourage them, thank them for their friendship and what they meant to him. To some, he would call on them to turn their life to the Lord because he knew they weren't living right. And I'll never forget when he got to me at 12 years old, sitting there holding his hand. He said, Bradford, you keep serving the Lord, son. Never stop serving God the Lord. Because one day you're going to look up and God's going to use you to do incredible things. Things you could never imagine. And I've remembered that all throughout my life. It was kind of a, a calling that I felt I needed to live up to, not because of some obligation, but because he had seen that in me. He had seen what God had placed in my life and he called it out to me, called me to that standard. A man who had been a success in so many ways in life. But at the end of his life, it wasn't about money. It wasn't about anything else. In fact, he knew he was taken care of. His salvation was secure. It was about others, particularly the next generation. I want to be a man like that. I want to leave a legacy like that. And maybe you're here today and you said, you know what? I, that's not my story. I didn't receive that kind of generational wealth. Well, guess what? It can start today. This can be the day that changes everything yeah. for generations to come in your family. Maybe you're here today and you've never started this generational journey with Jesus. It's time to take that step and make that decision. And all it is is simply admitting that we've sinned, we've messed up, and understanding that that sin has separated us from God and knowing that Jesus came from heaven to earth to bridge the gap. He lived perfectly, died sacrificially, and rose bodily so that we could be reunited with the Lord. 
And now he extends his hand and he says, if you put your faith and your trust in me, you can have a relationship with God in eternal life. And so I'd love to pray for everybody here today, but especially those who need to make that decision. Will you bow your heads and close your, your eyes? Dear Jesus, I pray for every single person here, every next generation Christ follower represented, whether that's children, grandchildren, co-workers, neighbors, people who need to hear the gospel. Help us to live a life that models you and let it be so contagious and so authentic that people take notice in our lives. And God, I pray with that person who doesn't yet know you. Lord, we admit that we have sinned and fallen short of your perfect standard. We choose to believe in you, that you lived, died, rose again, and now we choose to follow you every single day of our lives. It doesn't mean we're gonna be perfect, but when we mess up, we're gonna repent, we're gonna get back up, and we're gonna keep walking with you. Lord, we love you, and it's in your name we pray, amen. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching the Ed Young YouTube channel. That's right, and if you want to be inspired, encouraged, and challenged like never before, subscribe and click the notification button. We believe this channel can help change your life.